Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We welcome our visitors. Always glad to have you to visit us here at Northside. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we will certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We hope in doing the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. And if you get on the phone and call a friend, and have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour, then you'll be doing them a favor. And we appreciate it very much if you're doing us a favor. I'm talking to you there in the radio listen audience, of course. Just call someone and tell them to tune in to this station where you're now listening and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. So we welcome you that's listening in and you here in the auditorium. I'm going to speak to you today on the judgment seat of Christ. And I want you to follow me in the scriptures. Turn first of all to the book of Romans chapter 14. Brother Brock made mention of some people that God saved through my feeble efforts in the ministry since God saved me. And Brother Brock, I made mention of Jonathan Branion being here fine young minister, graduate of Tennessee Temple Schools. His father was the first preacher saved under my ministry when he was a teenage boy, about 16 years old. He was saved and God called him to preach and now God has used him. He's a pastor over in South Carolina. He has a son who, who is now a, a young minister working with Brother Brock at Camp Maranatha at the present time. He has some daughters, I believe some married missionaries, either called to be missionaries, one married a preacher, I believe. And, and so you never know when you win somebody to God, what God might do through that effort. And so I just want to mention that to encourage you in the matter of soul winning. Now today in Romans chapter 14, page 1208, I'll read verse, uh, beginning with verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now turn, when you please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, page 12, uh, 33 in my Bible. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 10 for the sake of time. When you have time, you might read the preceding verses. But it's page 1233, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now there's no such thing as one great general judgment. There's two judgments. There's a judgment of the saved and the unsaved as well as, well as other judgments in the Bible. But the two we're concerned about, of course, the one in particular now is the judgment seat of Christ. Later, we'll be bringing a message on the great white throne judgment of God. Now, in Luke chapter 14, verse 14, the Bible says, Thou shalt be blessed, for they, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the pronoun we is used 26 times. Now God's people must stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Now at the judgment seat of Christ, as we understand it, there'll be no sinners there. It's a place where God's people will stand to be judged. God will catch away the church at the rapture. Resurrect all the saints of God whose bodies are resting in the cemeteries or wherever they may be and we'll all move together and we'll all stand there at the great BMR seat, the great judgment seat of Christ and God will judge his people. Now at that time we're not going to be judged to find out whether we saved or lost. That is determined down here. We're judged at the judgment seat of Christ to determine our rewards. Now we know there's a judgment of the just and the unjust. We'll mention that the saved and the unsaved. It'll be another thousand years after this before the great white throne judgment of God. We'll say more about that then when we get to that in our series of messages. Now why will we be judged then at the judgment seat of Christ? 
It is not to determine whether we're saved or not. Some people say, well, we'll not know whether we're saved or not until we die. Then God will begin to weigh out our deeds, good deeds and bad deeds. And then if our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, then we'll make it. And if not, we won't. Now, that is untrue. That is not the truth. That is a lie of Satan. We will stand yonder at the judgment seat of Christ, not determine whether the saved laws, but determine your rewards are things God's going to honor you with for your service here on the earth. Now, I want to mention some of these things because I'm concerned. I want you to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing would thrill me any more than to see people that I've pastored stand there and receive a good reward. You know you like to see your children down here do well and inherit things or prosper or do good in business on their jobs or whatever. It makes you feel mighty good. To see your children blessed and helped and strengthened. I know it does me. But think about the judgment seat of Christ, how you're going to feel when you see your children in the Lord. Those you've won to God, those you've passed and even your own relatives stand there and receive good things from God and hear him say well done thou good and faithful servant if I could just stand in the background and see the people that sat under my ministry and people that I've tried to pastor and people I've won to God my loved ones and my friends stand there between me and the Lord and just see them being rewarded that would be reward enough for me that would thrill my heart and I hope that you will receive a great reward at the judgment seat of Christ it is a great thrill to win people to God, but it doesn't stop there. We want to see people do well for God and be used of God and be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. When a baby is born into this world, that's not the end. That's really the beginning. That's when mothers and dads begin to prepare for that child and, and help that child and see that child do well. And we should feel the same way in the work of the Lord. Just winning people to God is not all of it. That's very, very important, of course, but you don't stop there. You really begin there in developing them and helping them that they might do well. And then when they come to the judgment seat of Christ, they appreciate what you've done to help them along the way. Now, the Bible tells us our works shall be judged. Now, God has a lot to say about works in the Bible. Not to be saved, but because you're already saved. Salvation is not a works lesson to mention most, but God intends for us to work i believe in a faith that causes people to work and god wants us to work for him you'd be surprised how many times in this bible god mentions christians working work out your own salvation after you're saved work out your salvation uh, keep on for god the bible is always abounding in the work of the lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the lord God keeps a record of everything you do for him. You need to know that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved so as by fire. Now, God is going to try every man's work. He's going to do that uh, individually. That is, I will not answer for you. You will not answer for me in the way of works. Every man will answer to God for his own work and labor upon the earth. And we'll stand in the judgment seat of Christ and God will test to try our works to see whether or not they'll stand. I'm going to tell you in a few moments about some that won't stand. Why they'll not stand. But God will try our works if they pass the test. That's when the rewarding time will come. God will reward. He'll be giving out his gifts, his rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says, If any man's work shall abide, which is built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Not hope so, think so, or maybe so, but shall. If your works for God stand the test, at the judgment seat of Christ, you will be rewarded according to this book. Some people receive a full reward, a hundredfold. Some will only get a sixtyfold. And some will get a thirtyfold. And some will get nothing in the way of reward. In 2 John chapter 2, or 2 John rather verse 8, the Bible said, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, that we receive a 
full reward. Now God wants his people to receive a full reward. And you are to look to yourself, conduct yourself in the right manner, do that which is right, build on the right kind of foundation, if you expect to get a full reward. Remember there's a full reward, there's a part reward which is 60-fold, another less part reward which is 30-fold, and then some that'll get nothing. They'll be saved so as by fire, but get nothing at the judgment seat of Christ and no every reward. Do you want to be in that group or stand there and receive nothing and others walk away with rewards? That'll be a day when you bow your head in shame, I'm sure. If you stand there and receive nothing at the judgment seat of Christ, just barely be saved so as by fire. Now a man is rewarded on the basis of his faithfulness to Jesus Christ. God wants us to be faithful. You'd be surprised how much God has to say about being faithful in serving him on the earth. Now you can play around and, and be careless about serving God, but you're the loser. God wants us to be faithful in serving him. You build churches on faithful church members. We have too many up and down church members today up in the mountains on one Sunday and down on the sea coast the other. You don't build churches on church members like that. Church members like that will not be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. They enjoy the world too much. They are getting their reward here. And when they stand at the Beemar seat of Christ, they'll stand there empty handed because they have done nothing for God. God blesses those who are faithful in serving Him. You build churches and do the work of God through faithful church members. And you'd be surprised at what God has to say about faithfulness in the Bible. Not only that, but those that use their talent. Now, if you have a talent, and you do have, you have a gift. Every child of God has a gift of some kind. You can be used for God, according to 1 Corinthians 1. Now, you need to realize that you have a gift, and you can be used that gift for the glory of God. And if you use that talent, that a bit of that gift you have, God will give you other gifts to be used, talents to be used, other ways to glorify Him. And then you must build upon a firm foundation. There's a lot of people out here today that's got all fouled up in error. And they, some of them are saved. And they're not building on a firm foundation. And when they stand on the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to see their works all burned up. Right. There's some saved people that got involved in the Russellite movement. The Adventist movement. And uh, the Mormon movement. And many others. All fouled up in cults and false doctrines. And some of them even saved, not by their doctrine, but they got in there and laid in there by others. Maybe when they were babes in Christ, they may labor, stand on a street corner every day and give out their poison literature, stand before God and receive nothing. Right. All their works will be burned up. A lot of these people are going out in this charismatic movement today, hooping and hollering and jumping around and calling themselves to be gifted and speaking in tongues, all that kind of stuff. They'll come to the judgment seat of Christ, most of them, and see their works go up in smoke. They have done nothing for God. They put all the emphasis in the wrong place. You need to be straight in the Word of God. Know what the Bible teaches. Believe this book and stand on the true doctrines of God. If you're led astray by a false teacher and go out into false doctrine, led away into some denomination that's not out in God, you'll not be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Right. Be a lot of people there empty-handed. You need to be on a firm foundation. Be sure you're straight. Be sure you know what this book teaches. Learn all you can about it. Be sure when the preacher preaches, he's preaching this book. Take your Bible and follow him in the Word of God. Not only that, you, you, you're rewarded on the basis of your giving, of your financial means, and what else you can do for the glory of God. God expects his children to give financially. You have some church members. They're babes in Christ. They don't fully understand, evidently, they don't care about the work of God. They have the names on the church roll. They know the church has a great responsibility financially. They know the faithful ones are struggling along trying to keep God's work going. And maybe if they miss out two or three Sundays, they say, well, I didn't go to church today, therefore I'm not obligated to give anything. And when they do come, maybe drop in a little uh, money. How about the Sundays you missed out? You, God's going to hold you just responsible for those Sundays you miss and fail to give of your tithes and offerings as you would have if you were sitting in the church. 
Just because you miss a service doesn't leave you that responsibility. If you have your name on the church throne, you're obligated to stand by that work. And if you're not faithful in standing by that work, God's the best collector that you'll ever face. And God knows how to collect all of that, and God will collect that. And when he does, he's going to collect interest along with that. Now, good church members that love God, if they have to miss out two or three Sundays, when they come the next Sunday, they make up for those Sundays that they missed out in the way of financial support. That's the only way you can carry God's work on like it should be. Just because you're not in church on Sunday, that doesn't relieve you of that obligation. You're obligated as a child of God to give God at least one-tenth of your income. If you don't do that, you're robbing God. That's God's tithe, and you're taking that and spending that on yourself when it belongs to God. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. When you give God his tithe, if you slip an offering from yourself, God rewards you for that. Whenever you give God his tithe, that tithe's not yours in the first place. That's God's. And when you give God his tithe, then you give God an offering in addition to that tithe and see what happens. You can't outgive God. Amen. The more you give the Lord, the more he'll give back to you. So you're rewarded on the basis of your giving. Now, how can a person lose his reward? That's quite interesting. I want you to get it. How can a person lose his reward? Well, you can lose your reward by being unfaithful to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Here's a man had a talent, but he wouldn't use it. He was unfaithful. There's another man that used his, and he had ten talents. And Jesus said, Take the talent away from that man that wouldn't use his, and give it to the man that has ten talents. Now you lose your reward by being unfaithful, in the things of God and the use of your talents and your ability in serving God. Not only that, but you lose your reward by building on error. I've already mentioned that. I feel sorry for a lot of poor people that's caught up in some of these cults and caught up in some of these denominations that's teaching error. Many of us, some of them really love God, but they've been deceived and led astray by leaders, religious leaders. And they're working and sacrificing and they're building on a false foundation. They're building on error. And they're going to lose everything they have done. Everything they have done. A lot of people, you know, whenever you read and put the pressure on them and preach the word of God to them, they'll say, well, I think I'll just go join the church where the, and the preacher don't preach so hard. Well, I can just drop in now when I get ready. Well, when I decide to miss a few Sundays, nobody's thinking anything about it. I just join a crowd like that. That's one of the most foolish things anybody's ever done. What you're doing there is losing out and giving away your rewards and your opportunity to serve God. You can't run from God. You can't run from your responsibility. God will hold you responsible. I don't care where you go. That's right. Now you'll be surprised that the church members can't stand the heat. Can't stand the pressure. And when the preacher begins to tell them the truth and bat out on them, shell out the corn, they say, well, I think what we need to do is go join maybe a, a denomination of church, a modern church, and kind of get lost in the crowd. Then we go to church when we want to, stay at home when we want to. Preacher won't say anything about it. He won't miss it anyway. Nobody's saying anything about it. You better wait a minute. There's a God in heaven. He knows. He knows. He's watching. He's concerned. And so you, you, you be careful that you go and not build on error. You might go in and the support error. Someone was talking to me the other day about joining a situation where I had to support modernism and error in the cooperative program. I, I said, I can't do that. You support an error. And you need to be careful about that. And then another way you lose your reward is by taking glory to yourself in this life. God forbid that what you do for God that you should take the glory. You ought to be sure you give God the glory. Give God the glory of what he does through you. Don't strut around like a peacock and take the glory yourself and say, look what I've done. When you do that, you're like the Pharisees praying on the street corner. Jesus said, they have their reward. And when you strut around and think you're Mr. Somebody and you say, look what I have done. I want you to look at me, how greatly I'm used of God. That is your reward. You need to take the attitude after you've done everything you can that you still consider yourself an unworthy servant. And what God gives you, you don't deserve it. It comes by the goodness of God. Amen. So don't take glory yourself. That's where you lose your reward. Now at the judgment seat of Christ, there'll be some crowns given out. 
And I want to mention briefly these crowns that I heard toward the end of my message. Number one, that is the crown of life. If you read James chapter 1 and verse 12, read Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, you will find there the crown of life mentioned. Now that's a martyr's crown. These people who have died for the cause of God will get the martyr's crown. Unless you die for the cause of God, you won't. But if you die for the cause of God like Stephen's or others, you'll get the martyr's crown. Then second, there's a crown of glory. That one is mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. And that is a faithful minister's crown or the faithful pastor or servant of God's crown. The faithful servant of God is going to get the, the uh, crown of glory. That's a minister's crown. Every preacher can get that crown if he's faithful in serving God and doing what God tells him to do. Number three, that is the crown of rejoicing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19, For what is our hope of joy? A crown of rejoicing. Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord? Jesus Christ is coming for ye are our glory and joy. This is the soul winner's crown. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 is the soul winner's crown. Everybody that wins souls to God directly, indirectly, will get in on this crown. If you work with God's people in your church, wherever you work, getting souls to God, you might not go out and win a person individually, but you're helping others to win that person to God, and God keeps the record. That's a soul winner's crown. Then there's a crown of righteousness. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, henceforth Paul said, There's laid up me, for me a crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me it that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Now this crown is given to those that love the appearing of God. And if you love the appearing of God, that means that you're on the alert, you're on the move, you're on the watch out, you're serving God faithfully because you're expecting his return. That is the crown that God will give those that love his appearing. Then finally, there's the incorruptible crown. Now the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 through 27, that's coming an incorruptible crown, and that's the victor's crown. Paul said, they that run the race and gain the victory is going to get that crown. Every child of God can get the victor's crown. If you serve God to be victorious in serving the Lord at the end of life's journey, you'll get the victor's crown. Now the judgment seat of Christ is for the giving our rewards, is for the crowning of God's people. And Daniel tells us some's going to shine as the stars in heaven because of their effort in soul winning and doing the work of God. Are you going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ and receive nothing? That's a possibility. I hope that will not be true. Or you can stand at the judgment seat of Christ and hear him say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter thou the joy of the Lord. You've been faithful a few things. I'll make you rule over many. God wants each individual Christian to be faithful because you and you alone will determine your reward at the judgment seat of Christ. If God should call you home right now, how would your reward be at the judgment seat of Christ? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, you say, I've been kind of careless, but I'm going to get busy and get me reward now at the judgment seat of Christ. Serve God to glorify him because I love him. Well, you might not have too much time to do that now. But it would be good to go ahead and do what you can. Pick up the pieces and do what you can to the glory of God. And receive a good reward to the judgment seat of Christ. I'll give these two illustrations I close. God wants us to do what we can. I, I'm, re, I'm reminded of a story I read one time about a man, a businessman out on a trip. And he was coming in, it was his birthday, and he had three little children. His baby child was retarded, just a little fella. And the two oldest ones, the little children, of course, they knew daddy was coming home, it's his birthday, and so they got him a nice gift, had all wrapped up, beautiful ribbon around the little box, and they were waiting for daddy to come, and they saw him coming. And the two little girls ran out with their little gifts. They're so thrilled, they had daddy a little gift for his birthday. But that little retarded child had no gift, but he trotted along behind his little sisters. And he saw them with those gifts, and he saw a little yellow flower beside the walkway. And the little fellow reached down, he pulled that up, little yellow flower, held in his hands, retarded, running, weaving and waving to his daddy, and held up that little hand with that little flower. His daddy just laid aside all these other gifts, reached down, took that little retarded child into his arms, and took that flower, 
and tears rolled down his cheeks. He appreciated that little old flower more than he did all the other gifts. You know why? That little retarded fella, he was left out, but he did what he could. You may feel, well, I'm so little, I can't do much, but God wants you to do what you can. J. Harold Smith, great evangelist and used of God, told this story, and I'll tell this at close. Some of you heard me tell it before. He was in a tent meeting one time, and many people were saved. Family of drunks were saved. Man that was a drunkard, wicked, whipped his wife, beat his children. They got saved during the meeting. On the last night of the meeting, one of the little boys came up, had on his overalls, barefooted, walked up to Brother Smith and looked up with tears rolling down his cheeks. He said, Mr. Preacher, he said, uh, I'm so glad you brought your tent here. I I'm so glad my mom and daddy got saved and all the family got saved. Our home is different now. Uh, Mr. Preacher, and said, I don't have anything to give you much, but I want to give you something. The little fellow reached down to build his overhauls and pulled out two little round tobacco tags. Looked like the shape of a quarter. Had no money, but he got something as close, looked like money as he could find, and he brought that and gave it to the preacher. The little fellow stand there, tears in his eyes. Brother Smith said he stood there and wept, and he hugged that little fellow. He took those two tobacco tags. He said, I'd rather have them than any amount of money he could give me. He said, I have those tobacco tags today. I wouldn't take anything for them. He said, a lot of times when I get discouraged, I go and get them. And I look at them. I say, no, I got to keep on. And I put them away. He said, money can't buy those tobacco tags. He said, God looked on the heart of that poor little boy. He had no money but he did what he could. You may feel like you unworthy, you can't do much, but all God expects you to do is to do what you can. You must stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Stand up, feet. Dear Heavenly Father, we realize there's a time coming when all of us, each individual must stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Each one must give an account of himself to God for the service he's done, for the work rendered, for the life lived. Dear God, I pray that you'll help thy people, help us all to be more faithful in serving and doing what we can to the glory of God. Have you in this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. David's going to play a couple of stanzas. You're in this building unsaved. Backslidden on God, you want to join this church, you want to come forward for any reason, you may do so. While she plays a couple of stanzas, then we're going. It's not late. You obey God if God tells you to come forward. Maybe somebody needs to get saved. Maybe somebody needs to come back to God. Maybe somebody needs to join the church. Would you come?